Part three, chapter three of Indian Boyhood by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Boy Hunter. It will be no exaggeration to say that the life of the Indian hunter was a life of fascination. From the moment that he lost sight of his rude home in the midst of the forest, his untutored mind lost itself in the myriad beauties and forces of nature yet he never forgot his personal danger from some lurking foe or savage beast however absorbing was his passion for the chase the indian youth was a born hunter every motion every step expressed an inborn dignity and at the same time a depth of native caution his moccasin foot fell like the velvet paw of a cat noiselessly his glittering black eyes scanned every object that appeared within their view not a bird not even a chipmunk escaped their piercing glance i was scarcely over three years old when i stood one morning just outside our buffalo skin teepee with my little bow and arrows in my hand and gazed up among the trees suddenly the instinct to chase and kill seized me powerfully just then a bird flew over my head and then another caught my eye as it balanced itself upon a swaying bough everything else was forgotten and in that moment i had taken my first step as a hunter there was almost as much difference between the indian boys who were brought up on the open prairies and those of the woods as between city and country boys the hunting of the prairie boys was limited and their knowledge of natural history imperfect they were as a rule good riders but in all round physical development much inferior to the red men of the forest our hunting varied with the season of the year and the nature of the country which was for the time our home our chief weapon was the bow and arrows and perhaps if we were lucky a knife was possessed by someone in the crowd in the olden times knives and hatchets were made from bone and sharp stones for fire we used a flint with a spongy piece of dry wood and a stone to strike with another way of starting fire was for several of the boys to sit down in a circle and rub two pieces of dry spongy wood together one after another until the wood took fire we hunted in company a great deal though it was a common thing for a boy to set out for the woods quite alone and he usually enjoyed himself fully as much our game consisted mainly of small birds rabbits squirrels and grouse fishing too occupied much of our time we hardly ever passed a creek or a pond without searching for some signs of fish when fish were present we always managed to get some fish lines were made of wild hemp sinew or horsehair we either caught fish with lines snared or speared them or shot them with bow and arrows in the fall we charmed them up to the surface by gently tickling them with a stick and quickly threw them out of the water we have sometimes dammed the brooks and driven the larger fish into a willow basket made for that purpose it was part of our hunting to find new and strange things in the woods we examined the slightest sign of life and if a bird had scratched the leaves off the ground or a bear dragged up a root for his morning meal we stopped to speculate on the time it was done if we saw a large old tree with some scratches on its bark we concluded that a bear or some raccoons must be living there in that case we did not go any nearer than was necessary but later reported the incident at home an old deer track would at once bring on a warm discussion as to whether it was the track of a buck or a doe generally at noon we met and compared our game noting at the same time the peculiar characteristics of everything we had killed it was not merely a hunt for we combined with it the study of animal life we also kept strict account of our game and thus learned who were the best shots among the boys i am sorry to say that we were merciless toward the birds we often took their eggs and their young ones my brother chitana and i once had a disagreeable adventure while bird hunting we were accustomed to catch in our hands young ducks and geese during the summer and while doing this we happened to find a crane's nest of course we were delighted with our good luck 
but as it was already midsummer the young cranes two in number were rather large and they were a little way from the nest we also observed that the two old cranes were in a swampy place near by but as it was molting time we did not suppose that they would venture on dry land so we proceeded to chase the young birds but they were fleet runners and it took us some time to come up with them meanwhile the parent birds had heard the cries of their little ones and come to their rescue they were chasing us while we followed the birds it was really a perilous encounter our strong bows finally gained the victory in a hand-to-hand -hand struggle with the angry cranes but after that we hardly ever hunted a crane's nest almost all birds make some resistance when their eggs or young are taken but they will seldom attack man fearlessly we used to climb large trees for birds of all kinds but we never undertook to get young owls unless they were on the ground the hooting owl especially is a dangerous bird to attack under these circumstances i was once trying to catch a yellow-winged woodpecker in its nest when my arm became twisted and lodged in the deep hole so that i could not get it out without the aid of a knife but we were a long way from home and my only companion was a deaf-mute cousin of mine i was about fifty feet up in the tree in a very uncomfortable position but i had to wait there for more than an hour before he brought me the knife with which i finally released myself our devices for trapping small animals were rude but they were often successful for instance we used to gather up a peck or so of large sharp-pointed burrs and scatter them in the rabbit's furrow-like path in the morning we would find the little fellow sitting quietly in his tracks unable to move for the burrs stuck to his feet another way of snaring rabbits and grouse was the following we made nooses of twisted horsehair which we tied very firmly to the top of a limber young tree then bent the latter down to the track and fastened the hole with a slip knot after adjusting the noose when the rabbit runs his head through the noose he pulls the slip knot and is quickly carried up by the spring of the young tree this is a good plan for the rabbit is out of harm's way as he swings high in the air perhaps the most enjoyable of all was the chipmunk hunt we killed these animals at any time of year but the special time to hunt them was in march after the first thaw the chipmunks burrow a hole through the snow crust and make their first appearance for the season sometimes as many as fifty will come together and hold a social reunion these gatherings occur early in the morning from daybreak to about nine o'clock we boys learned this among other secrets of nature and got our blunt-headed arrows together in good season for the chipmunk expedition we generally went in groups of six to a dozen or fifteen to see which would get the most on the evening before we selected several boys who could imitate the chipmunk's call with wild oat straws and each of these provided himself with a supply of straws the crust will hold the boys nicely at this time of the year bright and early they all come together at the appointed place from which each group starts out in a different direction agreeing to meet somewhere at a given position of the sun my first experience of this kind is still well remembered it was a fine crisp march morning and the sun had not yet shown himself among the distant tree-tops as we hurried along through the ghostly wood presently we arrived at a place where there were many signs of the animals then each of us selected a tree and took up his position behind it the chipmunk caller sat upon a log as motionless as he could and began to call soon we heard the patter of little feet on the hard snow then we saw the chipmunks approaching from all directions some stopped and ran experimentally up a tree or a log as if uncertain of the exact direction of the call others chased one another about in a few minutes the chipmunk caller was besieged with them some ran all over his person others under him and still others ran up the tree against which he was sitting each boy remained immovable until their leader gave the signal then a great shout arose and the chipmunks in their flight all ran up the different trees now the shooting match began the little creatures seemed to realize their hopeless position they would try again and again to come down the trees and flee away from the deadly aim of the youthful hunters but they were shot down very fast and whenever several of them rushed toward the ground the little redskin hugged the tree and yelled frantically to scare them up again 
each boy shoots always against the trunk of the tree so that the arrow may bound back to him every time otherwise when he has shot away all of them he would be helpless and another who had cleared his own tree would come and take away his game so there was warm competition sometimes a desperate chipmunk would jump from the top of the tree in order to escape which was considered a joke on the boy who lost it and a triumph for the brave little animal at last all were killed or gone and then we went on to another place keeping up the sport until the sun came out and the chipmunks refused to answer the call when we went out on the prairies we had a different and less lively kind of sport we used to snare with horse hair and bowstrings all the small ground animals including the prairie dog we both snared and shot them once a little boy set a snare for one and lay flat on the ground a little way from the hole holding the end of a string presently he felt something move and pulled in a huge rattlesnake and to this day his name is caught the rattlesnake very often a boy got a new name in some such manner at another time we were playing in the woods and found a fawn's track we followed and caught it while asleep but in the struggle to get away it kicked one boy who is still called kicked by the fawn it became a necessary part of our education to learn to prepare a meal while out hunting it is a fact that most indians will eat the liver and some other portions of large animals raw but they do not eat fish or birds uncooked neither will they eat a frog or an eel on our boyish hunts we often went on until we found ourselves a long way from our camp when we would kindle a fire and roast a part of our game generally we broiled our meat over the coals on a stick we roasted some of it over the open fire but the best way to cook fish and birds is in the ashes under a big fire we take the fish fresh from the creek or lake have a good fire on the sand dig in the sandy ashes and bury it deep the same thing is done in case of a bird only we wet the feathers first when it is done the scales or feathers and skin are stripped off whole and the delicious meat retains all its juices and flavor we pulled it off as we ate leaving the bones undisturbed our people had also a method of boiling without pots or kettles a large piece of tripe was thoroughly washed and the ends tied then suspended between four stakes driven into the ground and filled with cold water the meat was then placed in this novel receptacle and boiled by means of the addition of red-hot stones chatana was a good hunter he called the doe and fawn beautifully by using a thin leaf of birch bark between two flattened sticks one morning we found the tracks of a doe and fawn who had passed within the hour for the light dew was brushed from the grass what shall we do i asked shall we go back to the teepee and tell uncle to bring his gun no no exclaimed chatana did not our people kill deer and buffalo long ago without guns we will entice her into this open space and while she stands bewildered i can throw my lasso line over her head he had called only a few seconds when the fawn emerged from the thick woods and stood before us prettier than a picture then i uttered the call and she threw her tobacco leaf-like ears towards me while chitano threw his lasso she gave one scream and launched forth into the air almost throwing the boy hunter to the ground again and again she flung herself desperately into the air but at last we led her to the nearest tree and tied her securely now said he go and get our pets and see what they will do at that time he had a good-sized black bear partly tamed while i had a young red fox and my faithful ohitika or brave i untied chagu the bear and wanahan the fox while ohitika got up and welcomed me by wagging his tail in a dignified way come i said all three of you i think we have something you would all like to see they seemed to understand me for chagu began to pull his rope with both paws while wanahan undertook the task of digging up by the roots the sapling to which i had tied him before we got to the open spot we already heard oitika's joyous bark and the two wild pets began to run and pulled me along through the underbrush chagu soon assumed the utmost precaution and walked as if he had splinters in his soles 
while wanahan kept his nose down low and sneaked through the trees out into the open glade we came and there before the three rogues stood the little innocent fawn she visibly trembled at the sight of the motley group the two human rogues looked to her i presume just as bad as the other three chagoo regarded her with a mixture of curiosity and defiance while wanahan stood as if rooted to the ground evidently planning how to get at her but ohitika brave generous ohitika his occasional barking was only in jest he did not care to touch the helpless thing suddenly the fawn sprang high into the air and then dropped her pretty head on the ground oh yeza the fawn is dead cried chatana i wanted to keep her it's a shame i chimed in we five guilty ones came and stood around her helpless form we all looked very sorry even chagoo's eyes showed repentance and regret as for oitika he gave two great sighs and then betook himself to a respectful distance chatana had two big tears gradually swamping his long black eyelashes and i thought it was time to hide my face for i did not want him to look at me End of part three chapter three part four of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain hakeda's first offering hakeda kuwa was the sonorous call that came from a large teepee in the midst of the indian encampment in answer to the summons there emerged from the woods which were only a few steps away a boy accompanied by a splendid black dog there was little in the appearance of the little fellow to distinguish him from the other sioux boys he hastened to the tent from which he had been summoned carrying in his hands a bow and arrows gorgeously painted while the small birds and squirrels that he had killed with these weapons dangled from his belt within the tent sat two old women one on each side of the fire unshida was the boy's grandmother who had brought up the motherless child wachiwin was only a caller but she had been invited to remain and assist in the first personal offering of hakeda to the great mystery this was a matter which had for several days pretty much monopolized uncheetah's mind it was her custom to see to this when each of her children attained the age of eight summers they had all been celebrated as warriors and hunters among their tribe and she had not hesitated to claim for herself a good share of the honors they had achieved because she had brought them early to the notice of the great mystery she believed that her influence had helped to regulate and develop the characters of her sons to the height of savage nobility and strength of manhood it had been whispered through the teepee village that Onchita intended to give a feast in honor of her grandchild's first sacrificial offering this was mere speculation however for the clear-sighted old woman had determined to keep this part of the matter secret until the offering should be completed believing that the great mystery should be met in silence and dignity the boy came rushing into the lodge followed by his dog ohitika who was wagging his tail promiscuously as if to say master and i are really hunters hakeda breathlessly gave a descriptive narrative of the killing of each bird and squirrel as he pulled them off his belt and threw them before his grandmother this blunt-headed arrow said he actually had eyes this morning before the squirrel can dodge around the tree it strikes him in the head and as he falls to the ground my oitika is upon him he knelt upon one knee as he talked his black eyes shining like evening stars sit down here said uncheeda to the boy i have something to say to you you see that you are now almost a man observe the game you have brought me it will not be long before you will leave me for a warrior must seek opportunities to make him great among his people you must endeavor to equal your father and grandfather she went on they were warriors and feast-makers but it is not the poor hunter who makes many feasts 
do you not remember the legend of the feast maker who gave forty feasts and twelve moons and have you forgotten the story of the warrior who sought the will of the great mystery to-day you will make your first offering to him the concluding sentence fairly dilated the eyes of the young hunter for he felt that a great event was about to occur in which he would be the principal actor but uncheedah resumed her speech you must give up one of your belongings whichever is dearest to you for this is to be a sacrificial offering this somewhat confused the boy not that he was selfish but rather uncertain as to what would be the most appropriate thing to give then too he supposed that his grandmother referred to his ornaments and playthings only so he volunteered i can give up my best bow and arrows and all the paints i have and and my bear's claws necklace grandmother are these the things dearest to you she demanded not the bows and arrows but the paints will be very hard to get for there are no white people near and the necklace it is not easy to get one like it again i will also give up my otter-skin headdress if you think that is not enough but think my boy you have not yet mentioned the thing that will be a pleasant offering to the great mystery the boy looked into the woman's face with a puzzled expression i have nothing else as good as those things i have named grandmother unless it is my spotted pony and i am sure that the great mystery will not require a little boy to make him so large a gift besides my uncle gave three otter skins and five eagle feathers for him and i promised to keep him a long while if the blackfeet or the crows do not steal him uncheeda was not fully satisfied with the boy's free offerings perhaps it had not occurred to him what she really wanted but uncheeda knew where his affection was vested his faithful dog his pet and companion hakeda was almost inseparable from the loving beast she was sure that it would be difficult to obtain his consent to sacrifice the animal but she ventured upon a final appeal you must remember she said that in this offering you will call upon him who looks at you from every creation in the wind you hear him whisper to you he gives his war-whoop in the thunder he watches you by day with his eye the sun at night he gazes upon your sleeping countenance through the moon in short it is the mystery of mysteries who controls all things to whom you will make your first offering by this act you will ask him to grant to you what he has granted to few men i know you wish to be a great warrior and hunter i am not prepared to see my hakeda show any cowardice for the love of possessions is a woman's trait and not a brave's during this speech the boy had been completely aroused to the spirit of manliness and in his excitement was willing to give up anything he had even his pony but he was unmindful of his friend and companion oitika the dog so scarcely had uncheedah finished speaking when he almost shouted grandmother i will give up any of my possessions for the offering to the great mystery you may select what you think will be most pleasing to him there were two silent spectators of this little dialogue one was wachuan the other was oitika the woman had been invited to stay although only a neighbor the dog by force of habit had taken up his usual position by the side of his master when they entered the teepee without moving a muscle save those of his eyes he had been a very close observer of what passed had the dog but moved once to attract the attention of his little friend he might have been dissuaded from that impetuous exclamation grandmother i will give up any of my possessions it was hard for uncheedah to tell the boy that he must part with his dog but she was equal to the situation Akeda, she proceeded cautiously you are a young brave i know though young your heart is strong and your courage is great 
you will be pleased to give up the dearest thing you have for your first offering you must give up oitika he is brave and you too are brave he will not fear death you will bear his loss bravely come here are four bundles of paints and a filled pipe let us go to the place when the last words were uttered hakeda did not seem to hear them he was simply unable to speak to a civilized eye he would have appeared at that moment like a little copper statue his bright black eyes were fast melting in floods of tears when he caught his grandmother's eye and recollected her oft-repeated adage tears for a woman and the war-whoop for man to drown sorrow he swallowed two or three big mouthfuls of heartache and the little warrior was master of the situation grandmother my brave will have to die let me tie together two of the prettiest tails of the squirrels that he and i killed this morning to show to the great mystery what a hunter he has been let me paint him myself this request unshida could not refuse and she left the pair alone for a few minutes while she went to ask wakuta to execute oitika every indian boy knows that when a warrior is about to meet death he must sing a death dirge hakeda thought of his oitika as a person who would meet his death without a struggle so he began to sing a dirge for him the same time hugging him tight to himself as if he were a human being he whispered in his ear be brave my oitika i shall remember you the first time i am on the war-path in the ojibwe country at last he heard unshida talking with a man outside the teepee so he quickly took up his paints oitika was a jet-black dog with a silver tip on the end of his tail and on his nose beside one white paw and a white star upon a protuberance between his ears hakeda knew that a man who prepares for death usually paints with red and black nature had partially provided oitika in this respect so that only red was required and this hakeda supplied generously then he took off a piece of red cloth and tied it around the dog's neck to this he fastened two of the squirrel's tails and a wing from the oriole they had killed that morning just then it occurred to him that good warriors always mourn for their departed friends and the usual mourning was black paint he loosened his black braided locks ground a dead coal mixed it with bear's oil and rubbed it on his entire face during this time every hole in the tent was occupied with an eye among the lookers-on was his grandmother she was very near relenting had she not feared the wrath of the great mystery she would have been happy to call out to the boy keep your dear dog my child as it was hakeda came out of the teepee with his face looking like an eclipsed moon leading his beautiful dog who was even handsomer than ever with the red touches on his specks of white it was now unchita's turn to struggle with the storm and burden in her soul but the boy was emboldened by the people's admiration of his bravery and did not shed a tear as soon as she was able to speak the loving grandmother said no my young brave not so you must not mourn for your first offering wash your face and then we will go the boy obeyed submitted ohitika to wakuta with a smile and walked off with his grandmother and wachuan they followed a well-beaten footpath leading along the bank of the assiniboine river and through a beautiful grove of oak and finally around and under a very high cliff the murmuring of the river came up from just below on the opposite side was a perpendicular white cliff from which extended back a gradual slope of land clothed with the majestic mountain oak the scene was impressive and wild wachuan had paused without a word when the little party reached the edge of the cliff it had been arranged between her and unshida that she should wait there for wakuta who was to bring as far as that the portion of the offering with which he had been entrusted the boy and his grandmother descended the bank 
following a tortuous footpath, until they reached the water's edge. Then they proceeded to the mouth of an immense cave, some fifty feet above the river, under the cliff. A little stream of limpid water trickled down from a spring within the cave. The little watercourse served as a sort of natural staircase for the visitors. A cool, pleasant atmosphere exhaled from the mouth of the cavern. Really, it was a shrine of nature, and it is not strange that it was so regarded by the tribe. A feeling of awe and reverence came to the boy. It is the home of the great mystery, he thought to himself, and the impressiveness of his surroundings made him forget his sorrow. Very soon, Wachuan came, with some difficulty, to the steps she placed the body of oitika upon the ground in a lifelike position and again left the two alone as soon as she disappeared from view uncheetah with all solemnity and reverence unfastened the leather strings that held the four small bundles of paints and one of tobacco while the filled pipe was laid beside the dead oitika she scattered paints and tobacco all about again they stood a few moments silently then she drew a deep breath and began her prayer to the great mystery. O oh, great mystery, we hear thy voice in the rushing waters below us. We hear thy whisper in the great oaks above. Our spirits are refreshed with thy breath from within this cave. Oh, hear our prayer. Behold this little boy and bless him. Make him a warrior and a hunter as great as thou didst make his father and grandfather and with this prayer the little warrior had completed his first offering end of part four part five chapter one of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain family traditions one a visit to smoky day smoky day was widely known among us as a preserver of history and legend he was a living book of the traditions and history of his people among his effects were bundles of small sticks notched and painted one bundle contained the number of his own years another was composed of sticks representing the important events of history each of which was marked with the number of years since that particular event occurred. For instance, there was the year when so many stars fell from the sky, with the number of years since it happened cut into the wood. Another recorded the appearance of a comet, and from these heavenly wonders the great national catastrophes and victories were reckoned. But I will try to repeat some of his favorite narratives, as I heard them from his own lips. I went to him one day with a piece of tobacco and an eagle feather, not to buy his MSS, but hoping for the privilege of hearing him tell of some of the brave deeds of our people in remote times. The tall and large old man greeted me with his usual courtesy and thanked me for my present. As I recall the meeting, I well remember his unusual stature, his slow speech, and gracious manner. Ah, oh, yes, uh said he my young warrior for such you will be some day i know this by your seeking to hear of the great deeds of your ancestors that is a good sign and i love to repeat these stories to one who is destined to be a brave man i do not wish to lull you to sleep with sweet words but i know the conduct of your paternal ancestors they have been and are still among the bravest of our tribe to prove this i will relate what happened in your paternal grandfather's family twenty years ago two of his brothers were murdered by a jealous young man of their own band the deed was committed without just cause therefore all the braves were agreed to punish the murderer with death when your grandfather was approached with this suggestion he replied that he and the remaining brothers could not condescend to spill the blood of such a wretch but that the others might do whatever they thought just with the young man these men were foremost among the warriors of the sioux 
and no one questioned their courage yet when this calamity was brought upon them by a villain they refused to touch him this my boy is a test of true bravery self-possession and self-control at such a moment is proof of a strong heart you have heard of jingling thunder the elder whose brave deeds are well known to the villagers of the lakes he sought honor in the gates of the enemy as we often say the great mystery was especially kind to him because he was obedient many winters ago there was a great battle in which jingling thunder won his first honors it was forty winters before the falling of many stars which event occurred twenty winters after the coming of the black-robed white priest and that was fourteen winters before the annihilation by our people of thirty lodges of the sac and fox indians i well remember the latter event it was just fifty winters ago however i will count my sticks again so saying smoky day produced his bundle of variously colored sticks about five inches long he counted and gave them to me to verify his calculation but you he resumed do not care to remember the winters that have passed you are young and care only for the event and the deed it was very many winters ago that this thing happened that i am about to tell you and yet our people speak of it with as much enthusiasm as if it were only yesterday our heroes are always kept alive in the minds of the nation our people then lived on the east bank of the mississippi a little south of where imnejaska or white cliff st paul minnesota now stands after they left millelax they founded several villages but finally settled in this spot whence the tribes have gradually dispersed here a battle occurred which surpassed all others in history it lasted one whole day the sacs and foxes and the dakotas against the ojibways an invitation in the usual form of a filled pipe was brought to the sioux by a brave of the sac and fox tribe to make a general attack upon their common enemy the dakota braves quickly signified their willingness in the same manner and it having been agreed to meet upon the st croix river preparations were immediately begun to dispatch a large war party among our people there were many tried warriors whose names were known and every youth of a suitable age was desirous of emulating them as these young novices issued from every camp and almost every teepee their mothers sisters grandfathers and grandmothers were singing for them the strong heart songs an old woman living with her only grandchild the remnant of a once large band who had all been killed at three different times by different parties of the ojibways was conspicuous among the singers every one who heard cast toward her a sympathetic glance for it was well known that she and her grandson constituted the remnant of a band of sioux and that her song indicated that her precious child had attained the age of a warrior and was now about to join the war party and to seek a just revenge for the annihilation of his family this was jingling thunder also familiarly known as the little last he was seen to carry with him some family relics in the shape of war clubs and lances the aged woman's song was something like this go my brave jingling thunder upon the silvery path behold that glittering track and yet my child remember how pitiful to live survivor of the young establish our name and kin the sacks and foxes were very daring and confident upon this occasion they proposed to the sioux that they should engage alone with the enemy at first and let us see how their braves can fight 
to this our people assented and they assembled upon the hills to watch the struggle between their allies and the ojibways it seemed to be an equal fight and for a time no one could tell how the contest would end young jingling thunder was an impatient spectator and it was the milky way believed by the dakotas to be the road travelled by the spirits of departed braves hard to keep him from rushing forward to meet his foes at last a great shout went up and the sacks and foxes were seen to be retreating with heavy loss then the sioux took the field and were fast winning the day when fresh reinforcements came from the north for the ojibways up to this time jingling thunder had been among the foremost in the battle and had engaged in several close encounters but this fresh attack of the ojibways was unexpected and the sioux were somewhat tired besides they had told the sacks and foxes to sit upon the hills and rest their weary limbs and take lessons from their friends the sioux therefore no aid was looked for from any quarter a great ojibway chief made a fierce onslaught on the dakotas this man jingling thunder now rushed forward to meet the ojibway boastfully shouted to his warriors that he had met a tender fawn and would reserve to himself the honor of destroying it jingling thunder on his side exclaimed that he had met the aged bear of whom he had heard so much but that he would need no assistance to overcome him the powerful man flashed his tomahawk in the air over the youthful warrior's head but the brave sprang aside as quick as lightning and in the same instant speared his enemy to the heart as the ojibway chief gave a gasping yell and fell in death his people lost courage while the success of the brave jingling thunder strengthened the hearts of the sioux for they immediately followed up their advantage and drove the enemy out of their territory this was the beginning of jingling thunder's career as a warrior he afterwards performed even greater acts of valor he became the ancestor of a famous band of the sioux of whom your own father oyeza was a member you have doubtless heard his name in connection with many great events yet he was a patient man and was never known to quarrel with one of his own nation that night i lay awake a long time committing to memory the tradition i had heard and the next day i boasted to my playmate little rainbow about my first lesson from the old story-teller to this he replied i would rather have weuha for my teacher i think he remembers more than any of the others when wayuha tells about a battle you can see it yourself and you can even hear the war-whoop he went on with much enthusiasm that is what his friends say of him but those who are not his friends say that he brings many warriors into the battle who were not there i answered indignantly for i could not admit that old smoky day could have a rival before i went to him again Onshida had thoughtfully prepared a nice venison roast for the teacher and i was proud to take him something good to eat before beginning his story how was his greeting so you have begun already oyeza your family were ever feast makers as well as warriors having done justice to the tender meat he wiped his knife by sticking it into the ground several times and put it away in its sheath after which he cheerfully recommenced it came to pass not many winters ago that wakinyantanka the great medicine man had a vision whereupon a war party set out for the ojibwe country there were three brothers of your family among them all of whom were noted for valor and the chase seven battles were fought in succession before they turned to come back they had secured a number of the enemy's birch canoes and the whole party came floating down the mississippi joyous and happy because of their success but one night the war chief announced that there was misfortune at hand the next day no one was willing to lead the fleet the youngest of the three brothers finally decided that he did not fear death 
for it comes when least expected, and he volunteered to take the lead. It happened that this young man had left a pretty maiden behind him, whose choice needlework adorned his quiver. He was very handsome, as well as brave. At daybreak the canoes were again launched upon the bosom of the great river. All was quiet, a few birds beginning to sing. Just as the sun peeped through the eastern treetops, a great war cry came forth from the near shores, and there was a rain of arrows. The birchen canoes were pierced, and in the excitement many were capsized. The Sioux were at a disadvantage. There was no shelter. Their bowstrings and the feathers on their arrows were wet. The bold Ojibways saw their advantage and pressed closer and closer, but our men fought desperately, half in and half out of the water, until the enemy was forced at last to retreat. Nevertheless, that was a sad day for the Wapetan Sioux, but saddest of all was Winona's fate. Morning Star, her lover, who led the canoe fleet that morning, was among the slain. For two days the Sioux braves searched in the water for their dead, but his body was not recovered. At home, meanwhile, the people had been alarmed by ill omens. Winona, eldest daughter of the great chief, one day entered her birch canoe alone and paddled up the Mississippi, gazing now into the water around her, now into the blue sky above. She thought she heard some young men giving courtship calls in the distance, just as they do at night when approaching the teepee of the beloved and she knew the voice of morning star well surely she could distinguish his call among the others therefore she listened yet more intently and looked skyward as her light canoe glided gently upstream ah poor winona she saw only six sandhill cranes looking no larger than mosquitoes as they flew in circles high up in the sky going east where all spirits go something said to her those are the spirits of some of the sioux braves and morning stars among them her eye followed the birds as they traveled in a chain of circles suddenly she glanced downward what is this she screamed in despair it was morning star's body floating down the river his quiver worked by her own hands and now dyed with his blood lay upon the surface of the water oh great mystery why do you punish the poor girl so let me go with the spirit of morning star it was evening the pale moon arose in the east and the stars were bright at this very hour the news of the disaster was brought home by a returning scout, and the village was plunged in grief. But Winona's spirit had flown away. No one ever saw her again. This is enough for today, my boy. You may come again tomorrow. End of Part 5, Chapter 1「Indian Boyhood」by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Stone Boy Oh, Mitakoda! Welcome, friend, was Smoky Day's greeting as I entered his lodge on the third day. I hope you did not dream of a watery combat with the Ojibways after the history I repeated to you yesterday, the old sage continued with a complacent smile playing upon his face no i said meekly but on the other hand i have wished that the sun might travel a little faster so that i could come for another story well this time i will tell you one of the kind we call myths or fairy stories they are about men and women who do wonderful things things that ordinary people cannot do at all sometimes they are not exactly human beings for they partake of the nature of men and beasts or of men and gods i tell you this beforehand so that you may not ask any questions or be puzzled 
by the inconsistency of the actors in these old stories once there were ten brothers who lived with their only sister a young maiden of sixteen summers she was very skilful at her embroidery and her brothers all had beautifully worked quivers and bows embossed with porcupine quills they loved and were kind to her and the maiden in her turn loved her brothers dearly and was content with her position as their housekeeper they were great hunters and scarcely ever remained at home during the day but when they returned at evening they would relate to her all their adventures one night they came home one by one with their game as usual all but the eldest who did not return it was supposed by the other brothers that he had pursued a deer too far from the lodge or perhaps shot more game than he could well carry but the sister had a presentiment that something dreadful had befallen him she was partially consoled by the second brother who offered to find the lost one in the morning accordingly he went in search of him while the rest set out on the hunt as usual toward evening all had returned safely save the brother who went in search of the absent again the next older brother went to look for the others and he too returned no more all the young men disappeared one by one in this manner leaving their sister alone the maiden's sorrow was very great she wandered everywhere weeping and looking for her brothers but found no trace of them one day she was walking beside a beautiful little stream whose clear waters went laughing and singing on their way she could see the gleaming pebbles at the bottom and one in particular seemed so lovely to her tear-bedimmed eyes that she stooped and picked it up dropping it within her skin garment into her bosom for the first time since her misfortunes she had forgotten herself and her sorrow at last she went home much happier than she had been although she could not have told the reason why on the following day she sought again the place where she had found the pebble and this time she fell asleep on the banks of the stream when she awoke there lay a beautiful babe in her bosom she took it up and kissed it many times and the child was a boy but it was heavy like a stone so she called him a little stone boy the maiden cried no more for she was very happy with her baby the child was unusually knowing and walked almost from its birth one day stone boy discovered the bow and arrows of one of his uncles and desired to have them but his mother cried and said wait my son until you are a young man she made him some little ones and with these he soon learned to hunt and killed small game enough to support them both when he had grown to be a big boy he insisted upon knowing whose were the ten bows that still hung upon the walls of his mother's lodge at last she was obliged to tell him the sad story of her loss mother i shall go in search of my uncles exclaimed the stone boy but you will be lost like them she replied and then i shall die of grief no i shall not be lost i shall bring your ten brothers back to you look i will give you a sign i will take a pillow and place it upon end watch this for as long as i am living the pillow will stay as i put it mother give me some food and some moccasins with which to travel taking the bow of one of his uncles with its quiver full of arrows the stone boy departed as he journeyed through the forest he spoke to every animal he met asking for news of his lost uncles sometimes he called to them at the top of his voice once he thought he heard an answer so he walked in the direction of the sound but it was only a great grizzly bear who had wantonly mimicked a boy's call then stone boy was greatly provoked 
was it you who answered my call you long face he exclaimed upon this the latter growled and said you had better be careful how you address me or you may be sorry for what you say who cares for you you red eyes you ugly thing the boy replied whereupon the grizzly immediately set upon him but the boy's flesh became as hard as stone and the bear's great teeth and claws made no impression upon it then he was so dreadfully heavy and he kept laughing all the time as if he were being tickled which greatly aggravated the bear finally stone boy pushed him aside and sent an arrow to his heart he walked on for some distance until he came to a huge fallen pine tree which had evidently been killed by lightning the ground near by bore marks of a struggle and stone boy picked up several arrows exactly like those of his uncles which he himself carried while he was examining these things he heard a sound like that of a whirlwind far up in the heavens he looked up and saw a black speck which grew rapidly larger until it became a dense cloud out of it came a flash and then a thunderbolt the boy was obliged to wink and when he opened his eyes behold a stately man stood before him and challenged him to single combat stone boy accepted the challenge and they grappled with one another the man from the clouds was gigantic in stature and very powerful but stone boy was both strong and unnaturally heavy and hard to hold the great warrior from the sky sweated from his exertions and there came a heavy shower again and again the lightnings flashed about them as the two struggled there at last stone boy threw his opponent who lay motionless there was a murmuring sound throughout the heavens and the clouds rolled swiftly away now thought the hero this man must have slain all my uncles i shall go to his home and find out what has become of them with this he unfastened the dead man's scalp lock a beautiful bit of scarlet down he breathed gently upon it and as it floated upward he followed into the blue heavens away went stone boy to the country of the thunder birds it was a beautiful land with lakes rivers plains and mountains the young adventurer found himself looking down from the top of a high mountain and the country appeared to be very populous for he saw lodges all about him as far as the eye could reach he particularly noticed a majestic tree which towered above all the others and in its bushy top bore an enormous nest stone boy descended from the mountain and soon arrived at the foot of the tree but there were no limbs except those at the top and it was so tall that he did not attempt to climb it he simply took out his bit of down breathed upon it and floated gently upward when he was able to look into the nest he saw there innumerable eggs of various sizes and all of a remarkable red color he was nothing but a boy after all and had all a boy's curiosity and recklessness as he was handling the eggs carelessly his notice was attracted to a sudden confusion in the little village below all the people seemed to be running toward the tree he mischievously threw an egg at them and in the instant that it broke he saw one of the men drop dead then all began to cry out pitifully give me my heart ah exclaimed stone boy exulting so these are the hearts of the people who destroyed my uncles i shall break them all and he really did break all of the eggs but four small ones which he took in his hand then he descended the tree and wandered among the silent and deserted lodges in search of some trace of his lost uncles he found four little boys the sole survivors of their race and these he commanded to tell him where their bones were laid 
they showed him the spot where a heap of bones was bleaching on the ground then he bade one of the boys bring wood a second water a third stones and the fourth he sent to cut willow wands for the sweat lodge they obeyed and stone boy built the lodge made a fire heated the stones and collected within the lodge all the bones of his ten uncles as he poured the water upon the hot stones faint sounds could be heard from within the magic bath these changed to the murmuring of voices and finally to the singing of medicine songs stone boy opened the door and his ten uncles came forth in the flesh thanking him and blessing him for restoring them to life only the little finger of the youngest uncle was missing stone boy now heartlessly broke the four remaining eggs and took the little finger of the largest boy to supply the missing bone they all returned to earth again and stone boy conducted his uncles to his mother's lodge she had never slept during his entire absence but watched incessantly the pillow upon which her boy was wont to rest his head and by which she was to know of his safety going a little in advance of the others he suddenly rushed forward into her teepee exclaiming mother your ten brothers are coming prepare a feast for some time after this they all lived happily together stone boy occupied himself with solitary hunting he was particularly fond of hunting the fiercer wild animals he killed them wantonly and brought home only the ears teeth and claws as his spoil and with these he played as he laughingly recounted his exploits his mother and uncles protested and begged him at least to spare the lives of those animals held sacred by the dakotas but stone boy relied upon his supernatural powers to protect him from harm one evening however he was noticeably silent and upon being pressed to give the reason replied as follows for some days past i have heard the animals talking of a conspiracy against us i was going west the other morning when i heard a crier announcing a general war upon stone boy and his people the crier was a buffalo going at full speed from west to east again i heard the beaver conversing with the muskrat and both said that their services were already promised to overflow the lakes and rivers and cause a destructive flood i heard also the little swallow holding a secret council with all the birds of the air he said that he had been appointed a messenger to the thunderbirds and that at a certain signal the doors of the sky would be opened and rains descend to drown stone boy old badger and the grizzly bear are appointed to burrow underneath our fortifications however i am not at all afraid for myself but i am anxious for you mother and for my uncles Ugh, grunted all the uncles we told you that you would get into trouble by killing so many of our sacred animals for your own amusement but continued stone boy i shall make a good resistance and i expect you all to help me accordingly they all worked under his direction in preparing for the defence first of all he threw a pebble into the air and behold a great rocky wall around their teepee a second third fourth and fifth pebble became other walls without the first from the sixth and seventh were formed two stone lodges one upon the other the uncles meantime made numbers of bows and quivers full of arrows which were ranged at convenient distances along the tops of the walls his mother prepared great quantities of food and made many moccasins for her boy who declared that he would defend the fortress alone at last they saw the army of beasts advancing each tribe by itself and commanded by a leader of extraordinary size the onset was terrific they flung themselves against the high walls with savage cries 
while the badgers and other burrowing animals ceaselessly worked to undermine them stone boy aimed his sharp arrows with such deadly effect that his enemies fell by thousands so great was their loss that the dead bodies of the animals formed a barrier higher than the first and the armies retired in confusion but reinforcements were at hand the rain fell in torrents the beavers had dammed all the rivers and there was a great flood the besieged all retreated into the innermost lodge but the water poured in through the burrows made by the badgers and gophers and rose until stone boy's mother and his ten uncles were all drowned stone boy himself could not be entirely destroyed but he was overcome by his enemies and left half buried in the earth condemned never to walk again and there we find him to this day this was because he abused his strength and destroyed for mere amusement the lives of the creatures given him for use only End of part five chapter two part six chapter one of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain evening in the lodge i had been skating on that part of the lake where there was an overflow and came home somewhat cold i cannot say just how cold it was but it must have been intensely so for the trees were cracking all about me like pistol shots i did not mind because i was wrapped up in my buffalo robe with the hair inside and a wide leather belt held it about my loins my skates were nothing more than strips of basswood bark bound upon my feet i had taken off my frozen moccasins and put on dry ones in their places where have you been and what have you been doing uncheetah asked as she placed before me some roast venison in a wooden bowl did you see any tracks of moose or bear no grandmother i have only been playing at the lower end of the lake i have something to ask you i said eating my dinner and supper together with all the relish of a hungry boy who has been skating in the cold for half a day i found this feather grandmother and i could not make out what tribe wear feathers in that shape ugh i'm not a man you had better ask your uncle besides you should know it yourself by this time you are now old enough to think about eagle feathers i felt mortified by this reminder of my ignorance it seemed a reflection on me that i was not ambitious enough to have found all such matters out before uncle you will tell me won't you i said in an appealing tone i'm surprised my boy that you should fail to recognize this feather it is a cree medicine feather and not a warrior's then i said with much embarrassment you'd better tell me again uncle the language of the feathers i have really forgotten it all the day was now gone the moon had risen but the cold had not lessened for the trunks of the trees were still snapping all around our teepee which was lighted and warmed by the immense logs which uncheetah's industry had provided my uncle white footprint now undertook to explain to me the significance of the eagle's feather the eagle is the most warlike bird he began and the most kingly of all birds besides his feathers are unlike any others and these are the reasons why they are used by our people to signify deeds of bravery it is not true that when a man wears a feather bonnet each one of the feathers represents the killing of a foe or even a coup when a man wears an eagle feather upright upon his head he is supposed to have counted one of four coups upon his enemy well then a coup does not mean the killing of an enemy no it is the after stroke or touching of the body after he falls it is so ordered because oftentimes the touching of an enemy is much more difficult to accomplish than the shooting of one from a distance 
it requires a strong heart to face the whole body of the enemy in order to count the coup on a fallen one who lies under cover of his kinsman's fire many a brave man has been lost in the attempt when a warrior approaches his foe dead or alive he calls upon the other warriors to witness by saying i fearless bear your brave again perform the brave deed of counting the first or second or third or fourth coup upon the body of the bravest of your enemies naturally those who are present will see the act and be able to testify to it when they return the heralds as you know announce publicly all such deeds of valor which then become a part of the man's war record any brave who would wear the eagle's feather must give proof of his right to do so when a brave is wounded in the same battle where he counted his coup he wears the feather hanging downward when he is wounded but makes no count he trims his feather and in that case it need not be an eagle feather all other feathers are merely ornaments when a warrior wears a feather with a round mark it means that he slew his enemy when the mark is cut into the feather and painted red it means that he took the scalp a brave who has been successful in ten battles is entitled to a war bonnet and if he is a recognized leader he is permitted to wear one with long trailing plumes also those who have counted many coups may tip the ends of the feathers with bits of white or colored down sometimes the eagle feather is tipped with a strip of weasel skin that means the wearer had the honor of killing scalping and counting the first coup upon the enemy all at the same time this feather you have found was worn by a cree it is indiscriminately painted all other feathers worn by the common indians mean nothing he added tell me uncle whether it would be proper for me to wear any feathers at all if i have never gone upon the warpath you could wear any other kind of feathers but not an eagle's replied my uncle although sometimes one is worn on great occasions by the child of a noted man to indicate the father's dignity and position the fire had gone down somewhat so i pushed the embers together and wrapped my robe more closely about me now and then the ice on the lake would burst with a loud report like thunder uncheeta was busy restringing one of uncle's old snowshoes there were two different kinds that he wore one with a straight toe and long the other shorter and with an upturned toe she had one of the shoes fastened toe down between sticks driven into the ground while she put in some new strings and tightened the others aunt four stars was beating a new pair of moccasins wabita the dog the companion of my boyhood days was in trouble because he insisted upon bringing his extra bone into the teepee while uncheeda was determined that he should not i sympathized with him because i saw the matter as he did if he should bury it in the snow outside i knew shintokicha the coyote would surely steal it i knew just how anxious wabita was about his bone it was a fat bone uh, i mean a bone of a fat deer and all the indians know how much better they are than the other kind wabita always hated to see a good thing go to waste his eyes spoke words to me for he and i had been friends for a long time when i was afraid of anything in the woods he would get in front of me at once and gently wag his tail he always made it a point to look directly in my face his kind large eyes gave me a thousand assurances when i was perplexed he would hang about me until he understood the situation many times i believed he saved my life by uttering the dog word in time most animals even the dangerous grizzly do not care to be seen when the two-legged kind and his dog are about when i feared a surprise by a bear or a gray wolf i would say to wabita now my dog 
give your war whoop and immediately he would sit up on his haunches and bark to beat the band as you white boys say when a bear or wolf heard the noise he would be apt to retreat sometimes i helped wabeda and gave a war whoop of my own this drove the deer away as well but it relieved my mind when he appealed to me on this occasion therefore i said come my dog let us bury your bone so that no shunktokicha will take it he appeared satisfied with my suggestion so we went out together we dug in the snow and buried our bone wrapped up in a piece of old blanket partly burned then we covered it up again with snow we knew that the coyote would not touch anything burnt i did not put it up a tree because wabeda always objected to that and i made it a point to consult his wishes whenever i could i came in and wabeda followed me with two short rib bones in his mouth apparently he did not care to risk those delicacies there exclaimed unshida you still insist upon bringing him some sort of bone but i begged her to let him gnaw them inside because it was so cold having been granted this privilege he settled himself at my back and i became absorbed in some specially nice arrows that uncle was making oh uncle you must put on three feathers to all of them so that they can fly straight i suggested yes but if there are only two feathers they will fly faster he answered Woo! wabeda uttered his suspicions Woo! he said again and rushed for the entrance of the teepee he kicked me over as he went and scattered the burning embers enna enna unchida exclaimed but he was already outside whoa 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 a deep guttural voice answered him out i rushed with my bow and arrows in my hand come uncle come a big cinnamon bear i shouted as i emerged from the teepee uncle sprang out and in a moment he had sent a swift arrow through the bear's heart the animal fell dead he had just begun to dig up wabeda's bone when the dog's quick ear had heard the sound ah uncle wabeda and i ought to have at least a little eaglet's feather for this i too sent my small arrow into the bear before he fell i exclaimed but i thought all bears ought to be in their lodges in the winter time what was this one doing at this time of the year and night well said my uncle i will tell you among the tribes some are naturally lazy the cinnamon bear is the lazy one of his tribe he alone sleeps out of doors in the winter and because he has not a warm bed he is soon hungry sometimes he lives in the hollow trunk of a tree where he has made a bed of dry grass but when the night is very cold like to-night he has to move about to keep himself from freezing and as he prowls around he gets hungry we dragged the huge carcass within our lodge oh what nice claws he has uncle i exclaimed eagerly can i have them for my necklace it is only the old medicine men who wear them regularly the son of a great warrior who has killed a grizzly may wear them upon a public occasion he explained and you are just like my father and are considered the best hunter among the santees and the sissetons you have killed many grizzlies so that no one can object to my bear's claws necklace i said appealingly white footprint smiled my boy you shall have them he said but it is always better to earn them yourself he cut the claws off carefully for my use tell me uncle whether you could wear these claws all the time i asked yes i am entitled to wear them but they are so heavy and uncomfortable he replied with a superior air at last the bear had been skinned and dressed and we all resumed our usual places Unchita was particularly pleased to have some more fat for her cooking now grandmother tell me the story of the bear's fat i shall be so happy if you will i begged it is a good story and it is true you shall know it by heart and gain a lesson from it she replied it was in the forests of minnesota in the country that now belongs to the ojibways 
from the Badawakantan Sioux village, a young married couple went into the woods to get fresh venison. The snow was deep, the ice was thick. Far away in the woods they pitched their lonely teepee. The young man was a well-known hunter, and his wife a good maiden of the village. He hunted entirely on snowshoes, because the snow was very deep. His wife had to wear snowshoes, too, to get to the spot where they pitched their tent. It was thawing the day they went out, so their path was distinct after the freeze came again. The young man killed many deer and bears. His wife was very busy curing the meat and trying out the fat while he was away hunting each day. In the evenings she kept on trying the fat. He sat on one side of the teepee and she on the other. One evening she had just lowered a kettle of fat to cool, and as she looked into the hot fat, she saw the face of an Ojibwe scout looking down at them through the smoke hole. She said nothing, nor did she betray herself in any way. After a little she said to her husband, in a natural voice, Marpitopa, someone is looking at us through the smoke hole, and I think it is an enemy's scout. Then Marpitopa, four skies, took up his bow and arrows and began to straighten and dry them for the next day's hunt, talking and laughing meanwhile. Suddenly he turned and sent an arrow upward, killing the Ojibwe, who fell dead at their door. Quick, Waduta, he exclaimed you must hurry home upon our trail i will stay here when this scout does not return the war party may come in a body or send another scout if only one comes i can soon dispatch him and then i will follow you if i do not do that they will overtake us in our flight waduta scarlet protested and begged to be allowed to stay with her husband but at last she came away to get reinforcements then marpitopa four skies put more sticks on the fire so that the teepee might be brightly lit and show him the way he then took the scalp of the enemy and proceeding on his track until he came to the upturned root of a great tree there he spread out his arrows and laid out his tomahawk soon two more scouts were sent by the ojibwe war party to see what was the trouble and why the first one failed to come back he heard them as they approached they were on snowshoes when they came close to him, he shot an arrow into the foremost. As for the other, in his effort to turn quickly, his snowshoes stuck in the deep snow and detained him. So Marpitopa killed them both. Quickly he took the scalps and followed Waduta. He ran hard, but the Ojibwe's suspected something wrong and came to the lonely teepee to find all their scouts had been killed. They followed the path of Marpitopa and Waduta to the main village, and there a great battle was fought on the ice. Many were killed on both sides. It was after this that the Sioux moved to the Mississippi River. I was sleepy by this time, and I rolled myself up in my buffalo robe and fell asleep. End of Part 6, Chapter 1 Part six, chapter two of Indian Boyhood by Charles Eastman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adventures of my uncle. It was a beautiful fall day, a gopher's last look back, as we used to say, of the last warm days of the late autumn. We were encamped beside a wild rice lake where two months before we had harvested our watery fields of grain and where we had now returned for the duck hunting all was well with us ducks were killed in countless numbers and in the evenings the men hunted deer in canoes by torchlight along the shores of the lake but alas life is made up of good times and bad times and it is when we are perfectly happy that we should expect some overwhelming misfortune. So it was that upon this peaceful and still morning, all of a sudden a harsh and terrible war cry was heard. Your father was then quite a young man and a very ambitious warrior, so that I was always frightened on his account whenever there was a chance of fighting. 
but i did not think of your uncle mysterious medicine for he was not over fifteen at the time besides he had never shown any taste for the field our camp was thrown into great excitement and as the warriors advanced to meet the enemy i was almost overcome by the sight of your uncle among them it was of no use for me to call him back i think i prayed in that moment to the great mystery to bring my boy safely home i shall never forget as long as i live the events of that day many brave men were killed among them two of your uncle's intimate friends but when the battle was over my boy came back only his face was blackened in mourning for his friends and he bore several wounds in his body i knew that he had proved himself a true warrior this was the beginning of your uncle's career he has surpassed your father and your grandfather yes all his ancestors except jingling thunder in daring and skill such was my grandmother's account of the maiden battle of her third son mysterious medicine he achieved many other names among them big hunter long rifle and white footprint he had a favorite kentucky rifle which he carried for many years the stock was several times broken but he always made another with this gun he excelled most of his contemporaries in accuracy of aim he used to call the weapon ishtabopopa a literal translation would be pops the eye my uncle who was a father to me for ten years of my life was almost a giant in his proportions very symmetrical and straight as an arrow his face was not at all handsome he had very quiet and reserved manners and was a man of action rather than of unnecessary words behind the veil of indian reticence he had an inexhaustible fund of wit and humor but this part of his character only appeared before his family and very intimate friends few men knew nature more thoroughly than he nothing irritated him more than to hear some natural fact misrepresented i have often thought that with education he might have made a darwin or an agassiz he was always modest and unconscious of self in relating his adventures i have often been forced to realize my danger he used to say but not in such a way as to overwhelm me only twice in my life have i been really frightened and for an instant lost my presence of mind once i was in full pursuit of a large buck deer that i had wounded it was winter and there was a very heavy fall of fresh snow upon the ground all at once i came upon the body of the deer lying dead on the snow i began to make a hasty examination but before i had made any discoveries i spied the tips of two ears peeping just above the surface of the snow about twenty feet from me i made a feint of not seeing anything at all but moved quickly in the direction of my gun which was leaning against a tree feeling somehow that i was about to be taken advantage of i snatched at the same moment my knife from my belt the panther for such it was made a sudden and desperate spring i tried to dodge but he was too quick for me he caught me by the shoulder with his great paw and threw me down somehow he did not retain his hold but made another leap and again concealed himself in the snow evidently he was preparing to make a fresh attack i was partially stunned and greatly confused by the blow therefore i should have been an easy prey for him at the moment but when he left me i came to my senses and i had been thrown near my gun i arose and aimed between the tips of his ears all that was visible of him and fired i saw the fresh snow fly from the spot the panther leaped about six feet straight up into the air and fell motionless i gave two good war whoops because i had conquered a very formidable enemy i sat down on the dead body to rest and my heart beat as if it would knock out all my ribs i had not been expecting any danger and that was why i was so taken by surprise the other time was on the plains in summer i was accustomed to hunting in the woods and never before had hunted buffalo on horseback 
being a young man of course i was eager to do whatever other men did therefore i saddled my pony for the hunt i had a swift pony and a good gun but on this occasion i preferred a bow and arrows it was the time of year when the buffalo go in large herds and the bulls are vicious but this did not trouble me at all indeed i thought of nothing but the excitement and honor of the chase a vast plain near the souris river was literally covered with an immense herd the day was fair and we came up with them very easily i had a quiver full of arrows with a sinew backed bow my pony carried me in far ahead of all the others i found myself in the midst of the bulls first for they are slow they threw toward me vicious glances so i hastened my pony on to the cows soon i was enveloped in a thick cloud of dust and completely surrounded by the herd who were by this time in the act of fleeing their hoofs making a noise like thunder i could not think of anything but my own situation which confused me for the moment it seemed to me to be a desperate one if my pony which was going at full speed should step into a badger hole i should be thrown to the ground and trampled under foot in an instant if i were to stop they would knock me over pony and all again it seemed as if my horse must fall from sheer exhaustion and then what would become of me at last i awoke to a calm realization of my own power i uttered a yell and began to shoot right and left very soon there were only a few old bulls who remained near me the herd had scattered and i was miles away from my companions it is when we think of our personal danger that we are apt to be at a loss to do the best thing under the circumstances one should be unconscious of self in order to do his duty we are very apt to think ourselves brave when we are most timid i have discovered that half our young men give the war-whoop when they are frightened because they fear lest their silence may betray their state of mind i think we are really bravest when most calm and slow to action i urged my uncle to tell me more of his adventures once said he i had a somewhat peculiar experience which i think i never related to you before it was at the time of the fall hunt one afternoon when i was alone i discovered that i was too far away to reach the camp before dark so i looked about for a good place to spend the night this was on the upper missouri before there were any white people there and when we were in constant danger from wild beasts as well as from hostile indians it was necessary to use every precaution and the utmost vigilance i selected a spot which appeared to be well adapted to defence i had killed two deer and i hung up pieces of the meat at certain distances in various directions i knew that any wolf would stop for the meat a grizzly bear would sometimes stop but not a mountain lion or a panther therefore i made a fire such an animal would be apt to attack a solitary fire there was a full moon that night which was much in my favor having cooked and eaten some of the venison i rolled myself in my blanket and lay down by the fire taking my ishtabopopa for a bedfellow i hugged it very closely for i felt that i should need it during the night i had scarcely settled myself when i heard what seemed to be ten or twelve coyotes set up such a howling that i was quite sure of a visit from them immediately afterward i heard another sound which was like the screaming of a small child this was a porcupine which had doubtless smelled the meat i watched until a coyote appeared upon a flat rock fifty yards away he sniffed the air in every direction then sitting partly upon his haunches swung round in a circle with his hind legs sawing the air and howled and barked in many different keys it was a great feat i could not help wondering whether i should be able to imitate him what had seemed to be the voices of many coyotes was in reality only one animal his mate soon appeared and then they both seemed satisfied and showed no signs of a wish to invite another to join them 
presently they both suddenly and quietly disappeared at this moment a slight noise attracted my attention and i saw that the porcupine had arrived he had climbed up to the piece of meat nearest me and was helping himself without any ceremony i thought it was fortunate that he came for he would make a good watchdog for me very soon in fact he interrupted his meal and caused all his quills to stand out in defiance i glanced about me and saw the two coyotes slyly approaching my open camp from two different directions i took the part of the porcupine i rose in a sitting posture and sent a swift arrow to each of my unwelcome visitors they both ran away with howls of surprise and pain the porcupine saw the hole from his perch but his meal was not at all disturbed for he began eating again with apparent relish indeed i was soon furnished with another of these unconscious protectors this one came from the opposite direction to a point where i had hung a splendid ham of venison he cared to go no further but seated himself at once on a convenient branch and began his supper the canyon above me was full of rocks and trees from this direction came a startling noise which caused me more concern than anything that i had thus far heard it sounded much like a huge animal stretching himself and giving a great yawn which ended in a scream i knew this for the voice of a mountain lion and it decided me to perch upon a limb for the rest of the night i got up and climbed into the nearest large tree taking my weapons with me but first i rolled a short log of wood in my blanket and laid it in my place by the fire as i got up the two porcupines began to descend but i paid no attention to them and they soon returned to their former positions very soon i heard a hissing sound from one of them and knew that an intruder was near two gray wolves appeared i had hung the hams by the ham strings and they were fully eight feet from the ground at first the wolves came boldly forward but the warning of the porcupines caused them to stop and hesitate to jump for the meat however they were hungry and began to leap savagely for the hams although evidently they proved good targets for the quills of the prickly ones for occasionally one of them would squeal and rub his nose desperately against the tree at last one of the wolves buried his teeth too deeply in a tough portion of the flesh and having jumped to reach it his own weight made it impossible for him to loosen his upper jaw there the gray wolf dangled kicking and yelping until the tendon of the ham gave way and both fell heavily to the ground from my hiding place i sent two arrows into his body which ended his life the other one ran away to a little distance and remained there a long time as if waiting for her mate i was now very weary but i had seen many grizzly bears tracks in the vicinity and besides i had not forgotten the dreadful scream of the mountain lion i determined to continue my watch as i had half expected there came presently a sudden heavy fall and at the same time the burning embers were scattered about and a fire almost extinguished my blanket with the log in it was rolled over several times amid snarls and growls then the assailant of my camp a panther leaped back into the thick underbrush but not before my arrow had penetrated his side he snarled and tried to bite off the shaft but after a time became exhausted and lay still i could now distinguish the gray dawn in the east i was exceedingly drowsy so i fastened myself by a rope of rawhide to the trunk of the tree against which i leaned i was seated on a large limb and soon fell asleep i was rudely awakened by the report of a gun directly under me at the same time i thought someone was trying to shake me off the tree instantly i reached for my gun alas it was gone at the first shake of the tree by my visitor a grizzly bear the gun had fallen and as it was cocked it went off the bear picked up the weapon and threw it violently away then he again shook the tree with all his strength i shouted i have still a bow and a quiver full of arrows you had better let me alone he replied to this with a rough growl i sent an arrow into his side and he groaned like a man as he tried hard to pull it out i had to give him several more before he went a short distance away and died 
it was now daylight so i came down from my perch i was stiff and scarcely able to walk i found that the bear had killed both of my little friends the porcupines and eaten most of the meat perhaps you wonder o Yeza, why i did not use my gun in the beginning but i had learned that if i once missed my aim with it i had no second chance i have told of this particular adventure because it was an unusual experience to see so many different animals in one night i have often been in similar places and killed one or two once a common black bear stole a whole deer from me without waking me but all this life is fast disappearing and the world is becoming different End of part six chapter two part seven of indian boyhood by charles eastman this librivox recording is in the public domain the end of the bear dance it was one of the superstitions of the santee sioux to treat disease from the standpoint of some animal or inanimate thing that person who according to their belief had been commissioned to become a medicine man or a war chief must not disobey the bear or other creature or thing which gave him his commission if he ever ventured to do so the offender must pay for his insubordination with his life or that of his own child or dearest friend it was supposed to be necessary that the supernatural orders be carried into effect at a particular age and a certain season of the year occasionally a very young man who excused himself on the ground of youth and modesty might be forgiven one of my intimate friends had been a sufferer from what i suppose must have been consumption he like myself had a grandmother in whom he had unlimited faith but she was a very ambitious and pretentious woman among her many claims was that of being a great medicine woman and many were deceived by it but really she was a fraud for she did not give any medicine but conjured the sick exclusively at this time my little friend was fast losing ground in spite of his grandmother's great pretensions at last i hinted to him that my grandmother was an herbalist and a skilful one but he hinted back to me that most any old woman who could dig roots could be an herbalist and that without a supernatural commission there was no power that could cope with disease i defended my ideal on the ground that there are supernatural powers in the herbs themselves hence those who understand them have these powers at their command but insisted my friend one must get his knowledge from the great mystery this completely silenced my argument but did not shake my faith in my grandmother's ability redhorn was a good boy and i loved him i visited him often and found him growing weaker day by day oyeza he said to me one day my grandmother has discovered the cause of my sickness i eagerly interrupted him by shouting and can she cure you now redhorn of course he replied she cannot until i have fulfilled the commandment i have confessed to her that two years ago i received my commission and i should have made a bear dance and proclaimed myself a medicine man last spring when i had seen thirteen winters you see i was ashamed to proclaim myself a medicine man being so young and for this i am punished however my grandmother says it is not yet too late but oyeza oh, i am as weak now as a rheumatic old man i can scarcely stand up they say that i can appoint someone else to act for me he will be the active bear i shall have to remain in the hole would you oyeza oh, be willing to act the bear for me you know he has to chase the dancers away from his den redhorn i replied with much embarrassment i should be happy to do anything that i could for you but i cannot be a bear i feel that i am not fit i am not large enough i am not strong enough and i don't understand the habits of the animal well enough 
i do not think you would be pleased with me as your substitute redhorn finally decided that he would engage a larger boy to perform for him a few days later it was announced by the herald that my friend would give a bear dance at which he was to be publicly proclaimed a medicine man it would be the great event of his short existence for the disease had already exhausted his strength and vitality of course we all understood that there would be an active youth to exhibit the ferocious nature of the beast after which the dance is named the bear dance was an entertainment a religious rite a method of treating disease all in one a strange thing about it was that no woman was allowed to participate in the orgies unless she was herself the bear the den was usually dug about two hundred yards from the camp on some conspicuous plain it was about two feet deep and six feet square and over it was constructed an arbor of boughs with four openings when the bear man sang all the men and boys would gather and dance about the den and when he came out and pursued them there was a hasty retreat it was supposed that whoever touched the bear without being touched by him would overcome a foe in the field if one was touched the reverse was to be expected the thing which caused most anxiety among the dancers was the superstition that if one of them should accidentally trip and fall while pursued by the bear a sudden death would visit him or his nearest relative boys of my age were disposed to run some risk in this dance they would take every opportunity to strike at the bear man with a short switch while the older men shot him with powder it may as well be admitted that one reason for my declining the honor offered me by my friend redhorn was that i was afraid of powder and i much preferred to be one of the dancers and take my chances of touching the bear man without being touched it was a beautiful summer's day the forest behind our camp was sweet with the breath of blossoming flowers the teepees faced a large lake which we called beda tanka its gentle waves cooled the atmosphere the waterfowl disported themselves over its surface and the birds of passage overhead noisily expressed their surprise at the excitement and confusion in our midst the herald with his brassy voice again went the rounds announcing the day's event and the tardy fulfilment of the boy's commission then came the bustle of preparation the outdoor toilet of the people was performed with care i cannot describe just how i was attired or painted but i am under the impression that there was but little of my brown skin that was not uncovered the others were similarly dressed in feathers paint and tinkling ornaments i soon heard the tom-tom's doleful sound from the direction of the bear's den and a few war-whoops from the throats of the youthful warriors as i joined the motley assembly i noticed that the bear man's drum was going in earnest and soon after he began to sing this was the invitation to the dance an old warrior gave a signal and we all started for the den very much like a group of dogs attacking a stranger frantically we yelled and whooped running around the sheltering arbor in a hop skip and jump fashion in spite of the apparent confusion however every participant was on the alert for the slightest movement of the bear man all of a sudden a brave gave the warning and we scattered in an instant over the little plain between the den and our village everybody seemed to be running for dear life and i soon found myself some yards behind the rest i had gone in boldly partly because of conversations with certain boys who proposed to participate and whom i usually outdistanced in foot races but it seemed that they had not carried out their intentions and i was left alone i looked back once or twice although i was pretty busy with my legs and i imagined that my pursuer the bear man looked twice as fearful as a real bear he was dressed and painted up with a view to terrify the crowd i did not want the others to guess that i was at all dismayed so i tried to give the war-whoop but my throat was so dry at the moment that i am sure i must have given it very poorly just as it seemed that i was about to be overtaken the dancers who had deserted me suddenly slackened their speed and entered upon the amusement of tormenting the bear man with gunpowder and switches with which they touched him far from gently upon his naked body they now chased him in turn and he again retreated to his den we rested until we heard the tom-tom and the song once more and then we rushed forth with fresh eagerness to the mimic attack this time i observed all the necessary precautions for my own safety 
I started in my flight, even before the warning was given, for I saw the bear man gathering himself up to spring upon the dancers. Thus I had plenty of leeway to observe what occurred. The bear man again pursued the yelling and retreating mob, and was dealt with unmercifully by the swift-footed. He became much excited as he desperately chased a middle-aged man, who occasionally turned and fired off his gun, but was suddenly tripped by an ant hill and fell to the ground, with the other on top of him. The excitement was intense. The bear man returned to his companion, and the dancers gathered in little knots to exchange whispers. Is it not a misfortune? The most sure-footed of us all. Will he die? Must his beautiful daughter be sacrificed? The man who was the subject of all this comment did not speak a word. His head hung down. Finally he raised it and said, in a resolute voice, We all have our time to go, and when the great mystery calls us, we must answer as cheerfully as at the call of one of our own war chiefs here on earth. I am not sad for myself, but my heart is not willing that my Winona, first-born daughter, should be called. No one replied. Presently the last tom-tom was heard, and the dancers rallied once more. The man who had fallen did not join them, but turned to the council lodge, where the wise old men were leisurely enjoying the calumet. They beheld him enter with some surprise, but he threw himself upon a buffalo robe, and resting his head upon his right hand, related what had happened to him. Thereupon the aged men exclaimed, as with one voice, "'It never fails!' After this he spoke no more. Meanwhile we were hilariously engaged in our last dance, and when the bear man finally retired we gathered about the arbor to congratulate the sick bear man. But to our surprise his companion did not re-enter the den. "'He is dead! Redhorn, the bear man, is dead!' We all rushed to the spot. My poor friend Redhorn lay dead in the den. At this instant there was another commotion in the camp. Everybody was running toward the council lodge. A well-known medicine man was loudly summoned thither. But alas, the man who fell in the dance had suddenly dropped dead. To the people another Indian superstition had been verified. End of Part 7